Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. Screen 2 Movie Thoughts the movie again starts you know with somewhat of a high profile you know kill with Jada Pinkett before she became Jada Pinkett Smith and it's you know there there are these African American stereotypes talking about African American stereotypes and horror and how you know it the, the movie literally opens with two black people talking about how horror movies don't have black people so it's it's you know it's it's almost the the characters contradicting the film itself and you know it's very much that he loves horror, but she really doesn't want to watch it, and he talks her into it anyway, which is very much a recognizable, you know, couple's dynamic for guys who are horror fans, you know, and, you know, again, somewhat stereotypical. And the... the The, this this entire first scene really captures the 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 way that a lot of viewers of slashers treat the killer character, how he becomes you know like like a mascot or something. They they you know the way. If you're watching an action movie, you know, you might really idolize the good guy in the action movie, you know, the, the action hero. But in a slasher film, it is often, you know, and to be fair, it often is the, that the killer is the most interesting character in the film. But nevertheless, you know, dressing up like the, the killer and really like cheering them on and such. Yeah, that, that is something that is very, you know, and, and Wes Craven would comment on this, or did comment on this in A New Nightmare as well, rather well. You know, with, with what Freddy Krueger had become. And, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's it, they're not like, you know, dressing up like Sydney or something, you know, they are like, yeah, you know, the the souvenirs or whatever, you know, for the sneak preview are the, the you know, the knife and the mask. And it's also noteworthy that when the, when Ghostface sits down, you know, wearing Steve's coat, when she turns away from at least some of the violence, he sits there and just watches, and yeah, there's there's this you know cool kind of commentary on you know that I mean he if he wanted to he could just kill her without you know without first sitting down, and you know he he kills her as soon as she realizes that it's not Steve you know she touches the jacket you know, realizes there's blood there, you know, she, she, like, cuddles up to him to feel safe and touches some of the blood that got on the jacket, and that's when he kills her, so he, he actually waits, you know, we, we don't know how long he would have waited if she hadn't happened to touch the blood just then, you know, and, yeah, it's just this, you know, again commenting on this notion that people who watch fake violence 
are you know detached and you know have less of a problem with real life violence you know and I do think that it's you know I don't know if you could really call it a plot hole or if it's like you know I don't know if like intentional but I mean these movies are already have all these things that do already have all these elements that don't really fit with reality but you know how exactly did you know did Gail as a writer or whoever adapted it for the screen know what to put in stab in the Casey scene because you know it's it's kind of like you know who heard him say rosebud you know it's you know the the when when the parents returned you know for sure like details like she was about to watch horror movies and she had put on like you know put if she was making popcorn sure those are and and what the house looked like and such which is of course also exaggerated here but the conversation which does bear a reasonable resemblance to the the conversation in the the opening of the first film yeah how how they knew that and and you know later on as well with I'm not sure that like Sid would be that interested in telling what you know in, in telling Gail what she said to you know the that's just the way the cookie crumbles it love that the, the casting for stab is perfect just so and and the the acting and the the way it's filmed and the whole thing the the exaggerated lightning in that opening just yeah fantastic work I, I believe it's Robert Rodriguez who directed those parts it's fantastic work and it's you know at first the you know the murder of Maureen you know the the other viewers think that that's just part of acting out because we're seeing all around them at you know people are chasing each other and you know pretend stabbing pretend dying and you know suddenly they do realize and yeah it's it's only when they do realize that they stop cheering on because which again you know oh are are they so detached and it you know it juxtaposes real and staged violence and the you know we also have this detail of the the this you know it's this stereotype that black women watching horror movies loudly you know warn the the you know the character you know don't go in the door and no he's hiding there you know and in this she actually does that and she points out not only what the character in you know in stab should do and it, it, you know her her suggest you know hang up the phone star 69 him call the police that's it that's it exactly you know in in that first scene she never does call the police and she never you know I, he says you know the police will never get here in time she could still try you know but you know in and in addition to that it's also just yeah you know the, these are things that you might have been saying when you were watching the the first film you know is what she's in you know that first scene and you know this is back when a scene of people not being safe in a theater would not have been in really bad taste. 
the in in this we don't know that the the two killers already know each other we've met both characters but you know the the two haven't shared scenes before the the ending and you know the 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 play you know the, from ancient Greece that Sid is playing the lead in you know its themes you know fit with the the film and you know the entire climax of the film plays out on the stage of this play you know at first it's just the stage in general but they actually you know when when Sid just first walks onto it it's just it's a stage it's a you know theater stage but the moment that you know before she meets either a killer the you know the the set stuff is you know lowered in front of so yeah and you know the the cameraman actually tries to leave when you know when you first see him you think oh this is a potential target i mean He's the black guy, you know, the black guy always dies first in the movie. The movie starts with two black people being killed, with with no, like, and and they're, they're super stereotypical. You know, they're a stereotypical couple with the guy wanting to watch horror movies, and she wants to watch, what was it, Meg Ryan? Or, no, wait, that was, no, Sandra Bullock. And, you know, and, and he's like, it's only if she gets naked, dude, the proposal, it's actually not bad. And, you know, yeah, and, and she's the, the black stereotype, you know, the female black stereotype of the theater goer yelling warnings at the character. So, yeah, you, you're like, is the movie going to kill this black person as well, you know? But then he actually leaves, and when he returns, you know, he only returns after the killers are dead. So, and, and that's the thing that never, hardly ever happens in slasher movies, you know, that a character is actually like, you know what? People are dying. I'm not going to stay around and risk dying myself and just leaves and only comes back once things have been, you know, when, when the killers are, you know, evidently dead. Now, you know, the scene with Cece is quite like the, the opening of the first film, you know, the the killer calls, and she doesn't quite know who it is, but goes along a little bit of the way, and, you know, and it is, you know, it's bigger, that, you know, sequel style, it's bigger than that scene in the first, and it's also, you know, if the, if it had been the first scene of this film, it would, you know, be just, you know, people would be, oh, come on, it's going to play out the exact same way, but, the the this this uh, you know placing it a little later is uh, yeah and it's not just you know a house albeit a pretty nice house it's this you know yeah it's it's a pretty big place as you know of course it is it's you know like a, I guess the sorority house itself for her sorority because the other sorority, one of the other sororities are, you know, having a party. So, you know, it's, you know, big place and she doesn't just get stabbed a bunch of times. She actually gets thrown off. Yeah. And, you know, this is where we do get some good, you know, ghost face dialogue. You know, I thought you were somebody else. That's okay. I am. And the, you know, and, and it really does, you know, at first you're like, but she's alone. And then another person shows up. Oh, then she isn't alone. 
she she has to call the police and she tries and you know the the campus security really and she tries and it doesn't quite work and we get the can you hear me now and yeah the and and you know of course the the reason part of the reason Joss Whedon wrote the character of Buffy is that you know he wanted a a subversion of the attractive blonde young woman who gets killed in the horror movie who who is a character in the movie so that an an attractive young blonde can die and you know Sarah Michelle Gellar of course you know portrayed Buffy and in this film she does play exactly that role you know and again it's it's this is in joke and you know irony of yeah and you know again plays like, like I said in the review plays with expectations for sequels and you know horror movies in general sequels in general the the fact that there's now more than one movie in this series the fact that you know yeah the, you know will will the types who you know will the types who survived the first one also survive this one it turns out you know Randy doesn't and you know I understand that it was part of, you know, they, they wanted that kind of, you know, everyone, anyone could die, even such a big part of the first one, but, yeah, it's just, you know, especially the fact that, I'm not going to give away exactly what, you know, might happen in, you know, any given sequel to this, but, it's just he's such a big part of what makes Scream scream and you know while this isn't the first movie and it's very clever you know it, it doesn't try to just be the first movie again part of what makes you know the these two movies what they are is Randy anyway the you know and and you know you wonder will the will the killers be the same you know also types and you know yeah these kinds of, of things now and you know comments of course on the relationships between media youth and violence I've already covered some of that and you know breaks the rules of, of slashers and yeah and you know the Dewey and Gale again I absolutely love their relationship as it develops as we see different stages over the course of the series and you know in this you know in the first one she was basically using him for information she she found him charming sure but she was mostly there for the the you know the story and in this one we do see them you know she clearly does actually care she she has no she's yeah she's not pretending and then you know they really you know they're really into each other with you know as as they're watching the tape and then you know suddenly we see this kind of stalkery footage from you know during yeah during the other murders and you know that right there is again this thing of you know there you know this this is a movie in which the you know the real life murders in this movie's reality have been turned, you know, from the first movie, have been turned into film, which is expected to do really well, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, there are now new murders taking place, and suddenly they are watching footage 
from around the time of the, you know, footage shot by the, you know, the killer and or their assistants or whatever, you know, the, so, so it again is this thing of, you know, and, and they were there to, you know, see footage, for, you know, they, they weren't expecting that, like, you know, what, what is it they say, you know, maybe the, the killer will be on one of the tapes, maybe we'll get a, a clue from that, you know, so they, they, you know, they weren't expecting to see violence, but they were watching something, you know, they were watching filmed footage relating to murder, and, you know, the it kind of brings them over closer to the murders when they see the stalkery film footage and it kind of it's it's this thing of you know these these films are in part about this staged violence. They, they talk about other horror movies and you know the moment you have fiction you know there, there's some form of staged conflict you know not always outright violence but you know in this we see that the killer is actually staging the violence you know in, in the first one you know it, really in, yeah in both of these they are trying to stage violence they it's it's not it's not random you know it's it's not that they suddenly just feel no they are trying to make in the first one they were trying to stage a slasher that they were part of in this one they're trying to stage a slasher sequel you know i it's it's too bad that the copycat thing doesn't really go anywhere after they, you know, bring it up. I wonder if it did originally before the leak and then that got screwed up. I, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, f and from watching this Stalker Vision footage, then suddenly they are being watched right now, you know, and it's again, it's another level. Not only was the killer, you know, watching his victims before killing them and and filming the you know now he's looking at them filming them so you know the moment you see the the stalker vision and you know someone put that on so you're already figuring that the killer must be you know in like the control room or something you know he's nearby he's operating this you know other TV but then the moment that they see themselves being filmed quote unquote right now and then you know that's when you know for sure okay so he is literally watching them right now about to attack them and you know it's it's this thing of you know i mentioned in the review that when ghostface calls you it means he's watching you but in this one not only is he watching you He's filming you. You know, he, he wasn't in the... That we know of, at least. It would have to be a very small camera. and a smaller camera than really existed in the late 90s, at least, you know, that, that they could get their hands on if he was using it in the theater itself. But other than that, he does seem to, you know, film most of the, the kills and the attacks. Or at least a lot of them. And, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I mean, the, the moment that it's a killer who stalks, you know that before he kills you, he's watching you and he's following you. But then, you know, to, yeah, to be made aware that he has not only been stalking, but actually filming, you know, he's been, he's been saving it. It's not enough for him to just stalk he's saving it and you know and he intentionally shows them that so it's not even like that he's hiding that he's filming it and then they see that they're 
being watched right now, being filmed right now. You are going to be the next victims. And then they see Ghostface right there in the, you know, yeah. And it's, you know, the, the scene is like a bigger version of the, you know, the scene in the van during the party in, you know, the climax of the first one. And, you know, you have the the two police officers, you know, genuinely following her and trying to protect her. And, you know, it's again this thing of if just the, you know, in, in both of these, you see that having police nearby is not enough. You know, although in the first one, it's really, it does end up being mostly the Dewey is there. And, you know, you could say, you know, maybe one cop is not enough. But in this... There are two cops, and they are specifically, you know, they are expecting Sydney to be attacked. And so they are right there. You know, she she is attacked even before, you know, hence police detail. And, yeah, it again, it's again this thing of, in, in a lot of these slashers, it is like, why don't you, you know, get to some more, get, get you know, go near some police, t explain to them what's going on, and say, you know, sometimes it does happen, sometimes that just doesn't work, or they don't believe, or whatever. They don't believe the victim telling them, or rather the target, the victim probably wouldn't be able to talk still. You know, so it's not completely unheard of, but, you know, nevertheless, it's like, Sydney, you're not an ethnic minority, you will be safer with the police. Yeah, it's, it's, um, and, and, yeah, you know, they're even right there in the car, and you think, you know, they, they, they must be completely safe there, you know, but, yeah, evidently not, and, and they even, you know, do these, you know, corny little cop jokes of, like, you know, the, the, you know, if we told you where we were taking it, we'd have to kill you. You know, it's, it's the the typical, like, joke or line you expect from, like, you know, maybe not police, but, like, you know, spies and the like. And, you know, mafia, whatever, you know. And then he says, the, the other guy says, don't ask, don't tell. I, I don't quite... Was he the one that Sidney thought was gay? And anyway... And, you know, Ghostface kills them both right there in the car. It's, I mean, that's some Sin City stuff right there, you know. Attacks through a window with the, with the blade and then, you know, kills the other. Yeah, and, you know, nice gory death with the thing through the, the head and... You know, Sarah Michelle Geller also got thrown off, you know, the, the balcony. And so, you know, so we have a few more, more elaborate kills than, you know, than the first one has. And in the, that scene, we also have the unmasking attempt. When... You know, I in in researching for this viewing of the film, I rewatched Welshie's excellent Scream trilogy retrospective, and he points out that the movie gets quite contrived in you know getting Sydney to you know where they want her to be for the climax of the film, you know and. Yeah, that is too bad. And he also points out that, you know, both actors playing the killers go way over the top. And, you know, the performances in the, you know, in the first ones we know they're killers has much, a much better, this, you know, a gradual rise in intensity and lunacy. And the, you know, when you see that 
Sydney so easily recognizes Mrs. Loomis. You know, she wasn't hiding for the rest of the film. I mean, she, there, there wasn't a scene where both she and Sydney were like, you know, but I mean, Gail says, I saw the, the pictures and she doesn't quite look, no, she had like work done or something, but she recognizes her so easily. Does that mean that if the two had met earlier on, I mean, Sydney doesn't really want to talk to the press, you know, in, in these films, but, you know, the press are trying to talk to her and, you know, Mrs. Loomis is posing as a reporter, so it, yeah. And, you know, it, when, when she sees Derek, you know, it's of course this thing of can Sydney trust the boyfriend? You know, he did show up right after, you know, when, when she's first attacked in this, he, the moment that she gets away from the killer, she runs into Derek. And then Derek runs back into the house. Wouldn't it be safer for them to get away from the house? And, you know, how is he going to protect her when he runs away? What if the killer, you know, gets, like, not necessarily past him, but just sneaks in a different way and then gets to her again? You know, but, yeah, he goes in there and then, you know... He was cut, but in a way that didn't do permanent damage, and, you know, he was supposedly cut. He, he claims he was cut, but then, you know, yeah, we, we don't see him and the killer in the same scene, you know, and, yeah. And when we realize that, you know, the the... Yeah, when, when, once we know that Mickey is the killer, it becomes especially like, you know, he and Derek are like, you know, they, he, yeah, is, you know, is it like with Stu and Billy? And, you know, she waits too long and he gets shot. And it's at that point, you know, that it's, you know, then, then it's completely established that Mickey probably framed Derek. You know, he when when Derek ran, you know, he waited, or yeah, yeah, he waited in case Derek would run into the house. Then he got to him, attacked him in just the right way, and then got away, so that it would look especially suspicious that this medical student would, you know, manage to be cut in just that way, and, you know, it's, it's, is, you know, history is already repeating itself, Sid is being attacked again, and it's a, clearly related to the events of the first, uh, you know, it's, it's clearly related to the murder of Maureen, Stephen, and Casey, so, or was it Stephen? Yeah, I think it was Stephen, rather than Stevens. So it's like, is it the boyfriend again? And, you know, Mickey even points out, you know, boyfriends and you, you know. And, you know, once once he shoots Derek, you know, I mean, he just said, I must have an assistance. And I also really like how we don't see that Mickey has the gun until he shoots Derek. You know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen and we, you know, we're maybe, you know, you don't expect him to suddenly have a gun and shoot. But, it, you know, of course he has, a, you know, the, both cops had, you know, a pistol each. So, of course, both killers have a gun each. So, yeah, you know, but the, you know, you, you don't know exactly what to expect. And you're going back and forth like she is. Can she actually trust Derek? And... You know, I mean, it's it's this thing of not only is, you know, it's in part she, you know, if she gets him down, is she saving his life or is she, you know, condemning her own? And if, 
you know, it's it's not just that she might, you know, if if she lets him down and he doesn't help her against Mickey, then you know, it's not that she just lost a potential ally by letting him down rather than leaving him up there. That you know, no, she also may have gained a killer. So, yeah, and yeah, suddenly he, you know. He shoots, the, Mickey shoots Derek, and then we're thinking, then maybe he did do it by himself. You know, and I, I love the dialogue there. Every line that of Mickey, Derek, and Sydney's there with like, no, no, dude, it's okay. We got her. You don't have to pretend anymore. And you know the, and and him, you know, yelling at Mickey, frustrated. Which you know, I mean, you you could say if I mean. Even if he was the killer, he might still say that, you know, he might be like, you know, he even does say, I'm going to kill you, you know, and, you know, if he's frustrated, maybe, you know, if he was the killer, maybe he's just annoyed that Mickey didn't wait until Sydney got that. Maybe he just wants to get back down from there. You know, he's like, come on, now we have to wait until you've killed Sydney before I can get down. This is just frustrating, you know, and... You know, so, so yeah, after that, you're like, maybe he did do it by himself. Maybe he doesn't have an assistant, or at least his, you know, partner, maybe at least his partner isn't a Billy. You know, Derek has, you know, Derek would be a, a Billy proxy, and Mickey clearly is a Stu proxy. Yeah, you know, he, so, so... You, you figure that, you know, once once you realize, and that's, you know, also during the film, you, you know, you think, could, are they really going to do Stu again? And will it, or, and or Billy? And then, you know, so you're like, okay, maybe he has, you know, maybe he doesn't even have a part, maybe he does, but it's, you know, it's not going to be a Billy proxy because the Billy proxy just died. And then we meet a different Billy proxy, you know, Mrs. Loomis comes in and it's again you know like like in the first this billy is the brains of the operation and you know i believe you know some someone posted a comment on my review of the you know of the first film and said that kevin williamson had said that he intended for you know, basically, Billy was going to, you know, if, you know, he, he didn't want Stu to, you know, he, Billy was the brains of the operation, and he would quite likely have betrayed Stu if, you know, if it came to that, if it hadn't gone wrong. And so, again, we have, you know, the Billy being the brains of the operation and betraying the, the Stu. And it's again, you know, Billy wanting revenge on Sydney for what she supposedly did to the family. And in this, it is very much, you know, I mean, with Billy's, it's like, your mother had sex with my father, which, you know, was obviously, you know, I mean, right there, it's, it's like toying with, it's saying that if a woman has sex, in a slasher movie, then obviously she's going to end up dead. That's the the moral rule, which the killer is reinforcing. You know, the killer is just killing the immoral. So the killer murders Maureen because she had sex. We didn't see it, but she had sex during a slasher movie. So obviously she's going to end up dead. And you know, from that, then the you know, if if the Women should definitely die from having sex. You know, it's again just old moral, you know, yeah. That, you know, today we realized, <laughs> a lot of us realized that it shouldn't still be like that. So, you know, when the, then the, the man must almost be like, I mean, she, I, I could, what, what could I do? She wanted to have sex. So, of course, you know, so Billy doesn't blame his father for you know, having sex with another woman and, you know, making the mother leave. 
he blames the woman that his father had sex with, you know, and then in this, Sidney actually blames, you know, Mrs. Loomis for leaving Billy, you know, that was what made him psycho, you know, so you did it. It's, it's you know, I love how Sidney fights back in these, how, you know, in, yeah, in, in the, the climax of these two, I'm not going to comment on the later ones yet, you know, that'll be in those videos. Yeah, she actually, she doesn't just take it lying down, she doesn't just, you know, play along or whatever, she, you know, the moment she can, she says, no, 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 this is your fault. Don't don't try to put this on me. You know, you know, I'm I'm not the one who's going around killing people here. And yeah, it's it's a, a very clever subversion there that, you know, I mean, you you can understand in the first one, you know, losing one of your parents, you know, that you know that that really hurts and that you know that happened to both you know Billy and Sydney and then in this it's like you know losing your son is also you know it's it's a really and and it makes it such a good companion piece to the first one you know it is like it's it's still you know the you know the the it's it's still the Loomis family trying to kill Sydney for what Sydney or her family supposedly did to them, you know. And then you have the the Stu, the the friend, and you know it's where there is some you know revenge kind of you know in in both of these there is some revenge motivation. But there's also, you know, there are other things going on. There's some more complex, you know. So not only did, you know, was it, it, it wasn't just about revenge. You know, in, in the first one, it's that Billy wants revenge for losing his mother, but he's also trying to stage a slasher. You know, he doesn't, he's not just killing, he wants someone to be caught for if if he just wanted Maureen dead and or Sydney, you know, he wouldn't go after anyone else. You know, he, he doesn't really have any reason to if it's about them. And if you know, if he just wanted them dead, then you know, you could either say maybe he doesn't necessarily care about getting caught, or you know, at the very least he's not gonna frame someone else. He's not gonna stage a slasher movie just to get revenge, you know, but that's, you know, slasher movies, often, it is often about revenge, you know, so, yeah, you know, he has a revenge motive, so he must stage a slasher film, and in this, you know, she's like, oh, it's it's not so 90s, it's just good old-fashioned revenge, so for the the Billy portion, the Loomis family portion of the motive, it is just revenge, but then we have Mickey, who, you know, he like he says, you know, Mickey you know, who wants to get caught, you know, and he he wants the the media attention of you know, yeah, he wants to become famous for being a murderer, which again, you know, the the movie comments on you know the relationship of media, youth, and violence. There are a lot of. There are several killers who have become extremely famous through the media in, you know, a recent couple of decades. And, yeah, then, you know, you know, in and in that, you know, there's always this thing of what, what are the media telling our children, you know, whether or not you believe that, you know, young people are that impressionable or what effect it's going to have, you know. Nevertheless, you know, young people can see this, you know, all this attention that, you know, actual killers are getting. So, you know, it's, it's again commenting on that and also, like, you know, he's basically... You know, they, they mention how they found each other via, like, online. I mean, 
you know, you'd expect that kind of thing like today on Craigslist, but back then too, yeah, interesting. But the, you know, it's the, the, you know, Mickey wanted to kill someone and, you know, to become famous over it, and he, you know, he's taking part in this killing that's like a copycat killing from the first one. You know, at first it seems like they're even going to be following the names, but, you know, then that doesn't, excuse me, keep going. But, again, if all it's about is Sydney has to die, then why attack anyone else? If if they specifically wanted Sydney dead, then why kill Maureen and was it Orth or Stevens? You know, because really, if they hadn't gone after, you know, the the moment that the two of them have been murdered, you know, the everyone's looking out for a murderer. If they hadn't killed them, then it would have been much, much easier to get to Sydney. So it's again, you know, they are, it's not just about this one, you know, clearly they want, you know, more, or at the very least are quite willing to, to kill more. And yeah, so he's reenacting the first film to, you know, or killing, you know, the killing starts at the, the the sneak preview and then it follows some of the survivors of the first one so you know again clearly co connected even before we know that the you know that there is a direct revenge motive which you know in in both of these we don't know before basically the ending you know and yeah you know so they are you know, they, they are in part basing it on films or on, other, you know, murders that have already been committed. So, yeah, you know, via the media, you know, Mickey, a young person, has seen all this other violence and it has inspired him. So there's, yeah. Now, we don't get a lot of screen time for Crazy Mickey or Crazy Mrs. Loomis, but it is quite a twist that it's them and then she shoots Mickey almost, you know, almost immediately after we even see her. And this is also just after we've realized that he's one of the killers. And we did get a lot of Stu and Billy, the, the killers. And yeah, the, the, I suppose that more or less covers that. And, you know, Dewey again survived, which, yeah, again, I, I love the, the relationship in these films between Dewey and Gale. And at the very end, Cotton gets the media attention that he wanted, you know, and there's that little bit where it's like, which, you know, will he shoot Mrs. Loomis or will he shoot Sid, you know, and he, he gets the cool action hero thing where he, you know, he, when he jumps onto the stage or like, you know, and he's already got the gun out and that whole, yeah, that's, yeah, and it's, it's again this thing of, yeah, you know, youth, media, and violence. He, you know, like, like I said in the review, he's not putting it all behind him. You know, he could choose to try to just, you know, yeah, just try to start a new life, try to not make it too big of a deal about it. He's been exonerated. But he wants more attention, you know, he, I, I believe it's also well she pointing out, it's, he acts like the world owes him something, you know, he was, he was innocent, he didn't do anything wrong, and yet he was treated as if he did something wrong, that's not 
fair. And that, that literally is not fair, of course. But he then takes from that that if I have been wronged, then that must be righted. And that means that I have to get something in return. You know, and I mean, at first, he's not too much about, like, you know, that... Sydney owes it to you know when when he realizes that Sydney didn't know that there would be an interview you know yeah that there would be that interview he's like you know Gail why didn't you tell her I didn't want to ambush her like at least that's the sense I get from him in in that you know in that scene where once again Sydney you know hits her bam and yeah, it's it's this you know, yeah, I, I also quite like how they treat Cotton's character in these films. You know, in the first he genuinely is just you know, he's there on screen for two seconds. You know, we're we're told, okay, he's you know, he's the guy who, who did it. And then at the end of the film, you know for sure that he wasn't. So in this, they give him a bigger role, and they use the fact that he, you know, he was thought to be threatening in the first. You know, in the first, you have no real reason to think that it, you know, you realize at the end for sure that it wasn't him, but until that, you don't know that it is. You know, you can maybe speculate, you know, Tatum brings up, but if it wasn't, you know, you can only hear that story so many times, you know. But the, the, you know, it's that, yeah, in, in this, when he approaches it, you know, that first time it's just the music sting, you know, but then he comes after in the, in the library and you know he just he keeps preventing her from from leaving you know and then goes after her for a little bit and, and you know yells and so it's it's again this you know he she was never comfortable with, with him in the first place but now he is acting very suspicious and it you know it becomes this thing of is it is he the one killing because he wants he wants attention from the media but he you know and he clearly i mean he's i don't know if, yeah he's he's very focused on sydney for sure and it's you know and it's very much in relation to the kills in the first did he actually you know somewhere along the line you know, become a killer, and, you know, and I, honestly, the, you know, I don't find, especially on a first viewing, that you that you really get as much of a I don't I don't feel like Mickey makes the impression that Stu does in the first you know in the first you know love him or hate him Stu is there and you know that he's there because he's he's loud and like you know he's yeah, he's most definitely there. So, you know, when when you see that it's him there at the end, it actually does, you know, you're like, oh, it, it actually was him, you know. In this, you know, the first time, right after he pulls off the mask, you know, you, you hear the voice, and it's like, do I know that? And then the mask comes off, and there's just, there's a little, you don't remember him right away. And that's just, that's really too bad. And I love Timothy Oliphant. It just, yeah, I, I find that he's not quite as, and I've seen some others point to that as well. And apparently before the, the leak, Hallie was supposed to be, a, you know, one of the killers, which 
would be a nice, you know, subversion in the first, she was, you know, one of the last victims, the, you know, not Hallie literally, but the, you know, the friend character, the, the female friend character who really wants to, you know, help out and tries to help her, like, emotionally, you know, in, in the first, it's like, you know, you're, you're right, maybe, maybe, you know, she, she could very easily be judgmental towards her, but she's, yeah, and in this, you know, Hallie's constantly telling her, you keep saying I'm fine, if you don't start living your life, you know, you know, and like, I think you're taking this, the, your, your psych classes too seriously, but she's right, you know, that's just, you know, bad things happen, that's just the way the cookie crumbles, and you do have to get back, you know, and, yeah, so, you know, from, yeah, where in the first one, Tatum was one of the last victims, and, you know, I'm, I talk about in the thoughts video for the first film, how you, you know, you're like, wait, is she gonna die? Because, you know, and then in this, you know, if she had actually turned out to be one of the killers, yeah, it's, because, again, it is this, when you see an innocent young woman in one of these films, you know, at, at the very start of the first one, you know, these 12 minutes in, you see the innocent, smart, you know, young woman who, you know, we don't know if she's like, you know, still a virgin, she, she does have a boyfriend, but, you know, she seems like the character who you'd expect to survive to the very end. So, 12 minutes into the first movie, you're like, clearly, the sweet, young, you know, very good-hearted, you know, strong female character is not safe in these films. So when you see Sid, it's like, are they going to kill her too? And then in this, again, so, you know, same with, with Tatum. And then in this, you know, with, with Hallie, if the, if she not only turned out to, you know, if she went from a potential victim or a likely victim even to a killer, yeah, that would be a very interesting subversion. I've reviewed other parts of this franchise, the links are in the description box. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.